everybody, in partnership with Poseidon Bikes, we're building up the brand new Poseidon Redwood gravel bike from start to finish in step-by-step -step format, so you can follow along and get rolling today. Now, the majority of this build is for the drop bar Redwood, but the process is mostly the same for flat bar models, and I'll cut to additional footage for anything that's specific to the flat bar model as necessary. Either way, you don't need to be an expert mechanic, and with a few basic tools, you'll be riding in no time. Now, you'll need a pair of wire cutters or scissors, a set of metric Allen wrenches ranging from two to six millimeters, a T25 Torx bit and driver, a 15 millimeter spanner or pedal wrench, bike specific grease, a bike pump with a press the valve head, a torque wrench with a newton meter scale, and optionally a bike work stand. Now if you're watching this video through the Poseidon website, then very briefly, the Bike Sauce is my YouTube channel featuring reviews, how-tos, and other bike related content with the occasional engineering spin. Once you get your Redwood built up, feel free to visit the channel for additional videos featuring the Redwood, including a full review and a series of upgrade videos as well. All right, so first open up the box and pull out the small parts box. Then pull out the saddle, which is already attached to the seat post and set it aside. Next, pull out the pair of wheels and lastly, pull the bike out of the box. Now the bike is honestly packaged really well, so grab a pair of clippers and be prepared to cut a lot of zip ties. Remove the packaging from the seat tube area on the frame and spread a thin layer of grease on the inside of the seat tube. Unpackage the seat and seat post and slide the seat post into the frame and cinch it down using a five millimeter Allen wrench. Don't stress too much about final position or bolt torque just yet, you just have to snug it down for now. Clamp the bike from the exposed seat post into a work stand if you have one. Now, if you're not using a work stand, there's no big deal, you can just skip this step. Continue removing packaging from the bike, again, being extra careful not to scratch the frame or anything else when you cut the zip ties. Rotate the stem with respect to the fork by loosening the two four millimeter stem pinch bolts. With the stem facing forward, rotate the fork to the proper orientation with the brake caliper on the non-drive side of the bike. Remove the stem faceplate by removing the four four millimeter Allen bolts. Orient the handlebar such that the brake and shift cables are out in front of and below the handlebars with no awkward kinks, twists, or bends. Keep in mind there's only one proper orientation for the handlebars, but it may take a couple tries until you find it. Shown here is the proper handlebar installation and cable orientation for drop bar models. For flat bar models, the concept is the same. You're trying to orient the bars so that the brake and shift cables have no awkward twisting. Shown here is the proper orientation for flat bar models. Reinstall the stem faceplate and cinch the handlebars down. Aim for an equal gap between the faceplate and the body of the stem above and below the handlebar. Roughly center the handlebars laterally, but don't stress too much as we'll do a final adjustment and torque check later. You can now remove any remaining packaging on the handlebars. The rear derailleur comes detached from the frame in order to prevent bent hangers during shipping. Now this is great for the consumer, but it does mean that you have to install it yourself. Now you'll first have to detangle the chain, which will invariably require a little bit of finesse. Now it's important to try and resist the urge to pull tightly on it and take your time and sort it out section by section. When you're done, the chain should be one continuous loop and you should be able to feed it over the chain ring while you install the derailleur. Now, if you find it too challenging to sort out the chain, you can always use a pair of quick link pliers and separate the chain and just reinstall it after you install the derailleur. Now, to install the derailleur, use the two screws that come pre-threaded into the hanger. Note that these screw in from the outer side of the frame. Now, there's no need to over-tighten them, but make sure they're tight enough so that they won't back out while riding. Next, remove the packaging from the wheels, including any caps on the hubs. You should be able to see all the way through the hub with the packaging removed. Now, now in an effort to avoid bent disc rotors during shipping, the Redwood now comes with the rotors removed. But not to worry, installation is pretty simple via the included disc rotor bolts. Set the wheel down on a stable surface. I actually found that the empty small parts box works perfectly. Unpackage the disc rotors carefully, doing your best not to touch the braking surface with your bare hands. They do need to be clean for optimal braking performance. Note the direction of rotation of the rotor and set it down on the hub and thread in the six T25 Torx head rotor bolts. When they're all cinched down, make sure to go in a star pattern and torque them to the proper spec, which is four to six Newton meters for these Tektro rotors. Once you're finished, you can repeat this process for the other wheel as well. Next, grab the rear through axle, which came in the small parts box. It should be the longer one of the two. Install the rear wheel, pulling the chain onto the cassette and ensuring that the disc rotor slides between the brake pads in the caliper. Align the hub in the dropouts and feed the lightly greased through axle in from the non-drive side. Thread it in and tighten it down with a six millimeter Allen to anywhere between nine to 13 Newton meters. Next, find the shorter front axle and the threaded axle nut. Lightly grease the interface and inside insert the nut into the right side of the fork dropout. Slide the front wheel in the fork, making sure the disc rotor slides between the two brake pads, and slide the lightly greased through axle in from the non-drive side 
and tighten it down with a 6 millimeter Allen, again aiming for 9 to 13 newton meters of torque. Secure the nut in the fork dropout by tightening the 2 millimeter grub screw in the bottom of the dropout. Now there's no need to over tighten this screw, just ensure that it won't back out on its own. Now for the brakes, there may be a little bit of setup required as well. These Tektro brakes are dual piston actuated, meaning that both brake pads move inward toward the rotor when you squeeze the brake lever. The calipers also have a dual sided pad adjustment, which allows you to bring the pads closer to or further from the disc rotors using a 3 millimeter Allen wrench. Now if you hear the brake pads rubbing when you spin the wheel, it's it's really helpful to shine a light behind the rotor, which should reveal where the rubbing is occurring. You can then make fine adjustments to each individual pad until the disc rub is gone. Now, if you've reached the maximum pad displacement and you still have rubbing, you can also loosen the two caliper mounting bolts and slide the caliper itself laterally until there's an equal gap on either side of the rotor. Out of the box, the brakes are generally set up to have a mid-range lever pull, so it's likely that you won't need to adjust the cable tension. Now, if you prefer the pads to bite a little bit sooner for a tighter brake feel, you can turn the barrel adjuster counterclockwise as if to loosen it by a quarter turn at a time until the desired lever feel is achieved. Or you can also turn the barrel adjuster clockwise to achieve a looser brake feel. Now brake setup is the same for both drop and flat bar models, although for the flat bar models there's also a barrel adjuster at the lever itself. Next unpackage the pedals, which again can be found in the small parts box. Note that the pedals are left right specific and they can't be switched. The right side or the drive side will have normal threads, while the non-drive side will use a reverse thread. Lightly grease the pedal threads and hand tighten them into the cranks, making sure not to cross thread them. They should thread in with little effort until you snug them up against the crank arms. Use a 15 millimeter pedal wrench or a thin spanner or an adjustable wrench to tighten the pedals. Now the pedals should be very tight, but you don't need to overdo it. 35 to 40 newton meters is a typical torque spec or roughly 30 pounds of force at a lever arm of one foot. Now the bike's shifting should be pretty well adjusted out of the box, but you may need to make some basic adjustments. The MicroShift Advent X 10-speed system is a budget option, but when dialed in, it performs really well. You'll notice that there's two levers on the side of the shifter. The upper lever will shift into a smaller rear cog, giving you higher top-end speed, but less of an ability to climb hills. The lower lever, on the other hand, will shift you into a larger rear cog, giving you lower top end speed, but a greater ability to climb steep hills. Now on the flat bar version, the mountain bike style shifter has two thumb paddles, which serve the same purpose as the high and low paddles on the drop bar shifters. Run through the gears to make sure you can smoothly shift into every gear on the cassette. If it's hesitating to shift into a larger cog, Twist the barrel adjuster counterclockwise as if to unscrew it by a quarter turn at a time until you can smoothly shift from small cogs into larger ones. Now if it's hesitating to shift from larger cogs into smaller cogs, you can turn the barrel adjuster clockwise as if to tighten it until you can shift from larger cogs into smaller ones. Now this process is called indexing the gears and may or may not need to be done out of the box. In the unlikely event that you can't smoothly shift up and down the cassette after indexing the gears, it might be an issue of hanger alignment B screw adjustment or high and low limit screw adjustment, all of which are easily addressed by a qualified mechanic, but a little bit beyond the scope of this video. Now I should mention a nice feature about the Advent X derailleur, which is the integrated clutch. You'll notice that there's a two position switch on the side of the derailleur, which engages and disengages the built-in clutch. When disengaged, the lower cage is free to move with very little resistance. Now this generally yields slightly smoother shifting at the expense of chain stability. Now on the other hand, when the clutch is engaged, there's a lot more resistance in the lower cage, which helps with chain retention and significantly reduces what's known as chain slap, where the chain can bounce around and can potentially chip or ding your frame, or worse, fall off entirely. Now generally, you can always ride with the clutch engaged unless you plan to ride in absolutely smooth conditions with no off-road sections. Inflate your tires to your preferred pressure using a floor pump with a Presta compatible head or a basic pump and a Presta valve adapter. Remove the valve cap and be sure to loosen the valve nut all the way. There's no need to worry, it can't fall off, so just loosen it until it stops turning. Now, tire pressure in general is very personal and it depends on the rider weight, the riding style, and of course the terrain. Now, for these stock tires with inner tubes, I recommend a pressure somewhere between 20 and 35 psi. Now, you might be tempted to pump them up higher, but recent trends are all leaning towards lower pressures, improving comfort and grip at no significant expense to rolling efficiency. When you're finished, be sure to close the valve and reinstall the cap. With the bike on the ground now, we'll start to make some final adjustments. You can adjust the seat angle and fore aft position by loosening the single six millimeter bolt underneath the saddle. A good starting point would be a flat saddle about midway between the two endpoints. When you're finished, make sure to torque the saddle bolt down tight. Now in my experience, the headsets on the Redwoods come a little bit tight from the factory, so it's a good idea to adjust them before you set off. To do this, loosen 
loosen the two four millimeter stem pinch bolts, then loosen the top cap bolt with a five millimeter Allen wrench until the handlebars can spin freely with little to no resistance. Then tighten the top cap back down by another eighth of a turn or even a little bit less just to eliminate any play in the headset. If the handlebars don't spin freely, your headset is too tight and you'll wear your headset bearings prematurely. Once you have the preload set, make sure the handlebars are straight with respect to the front wheel and tighten down the stem bolts, alternating bolts by half a turn or so until they're both equally tight. Now, if you can't stand the idea of your handlebars being anything but perfectly straight, this video up here will help you get them perfectly aligned. Adjust the saddle height by using the five millimeter pinch bolt at the top of the seat tube. When sitting on the saddle, you should have a slight bend in the knee when your foot is at the bottom of the pedal stroke. Now in general, you wanna aim for about a 20 to 25 degree bend in the knee for starters. If the saddle is too low, you'll lose out on pedaling efficiency. And if it's too high, it can lead to knee pain or other physical pain. You can also adjust the position of your brifters via the five millimeter Allen bolt that's buried under the rubber hoods. The single pinch bolt will allow you to rotate the shifters and move them vertically a few millimeters in either direction. For flat bar models, you can also adjust the position and angle of your brake levers and shifter using the single five millimeter Allen bolt. And once you're happy with your bike's fit and feel, it's really good practice to torque all the bolts down to the proper torque specification using a dedicated torque wrench. Stem pinch bolts, handlebar pinch bolts, and seat post clamps should all get about five newton meters of torque while the shifter should get between six and eight Newton meters. Use some isopropyl alcohol to clean off the rotors and in general, try really hard not to touch them or to get any oily substances on them. Once your brake pads absorb oil or grease, they're pretty much toast and will need to be replaced. Now, lastly, before you go out for your first ride, be sure to bed the brakes properly to ensure optimal braking performance. The bedding process serves to deposit a bit of the brake pad material onto the disc rotor itself, which is essential for strong braking performance. Find an open space and get up to about 15 miles per hour and then drag the front brake with moderate braking force until you reach walking speed, but don't come to a complete stop. You wanna turn around and repeat this process 15 to 20 times and the brake should start to bite stronger and stronger, but still won't reach full strength for at least a few dozen miles. Repeat this process for the rear brake, which will complete the bedding process. And finally, as with any new bike, after the first two or three months of riding, it's always a good idea to have your bike checked over by a qualified mechanic. Factory tightened bolts may come loose over time and cables tend to stretch out a bit over the first few rides, which can affect braking and shifting. It should be a pretty quick and inexpensive service, but highly recommended. And that, believe it or not, is it. Your new Redwood is all set up and ready for whatever adventures await. Congratulations on your new bike and enjoy the ride.